E Life Church. Get in the game. Experience Lab, how are we? Any Coldplay fans? Coldplay fans in the house? Do we not have an awesome band? Are these guys not incredible? I also want to give a special shout out to those of you that are watching at Church Online or in one of our video services. We are so glad that you're here today with us as well. Hey, next weekend, Experience Lab, we're starting a new series called Oikos. You're like, is that a cuss word in another language? Sort of. But not really. So anyways, I come back for that. Basically, we'll be talking about how to have spiritual conversations with your friends without it being awkward. All right? Like without going up to somebody being like, hey, dude, you know you're going to hell? Have a great day. You know what I mean? We, that's, that's pretty awkward. We think spiritual conversations are important, but don't want to be awkward. So Oikos, our next series, we do this each year. It's a lot of fun. Hope you'll come back for that. Starts next weekend. And then three weeks from today, three weeks from today, what's coming up? Easter is going to be here, man, and I'm telling you what, it's going to be awesome. We're pulling out all the stops at the movies is the series we're starting, pulling out the red carpet. We're going to have concessions, candy, Cokes, popcorn, ushers with flashlights. I mean, this is it. You can be at the movies, baby. I mean, it's going to be awesome. You want to bring everybody you know, bring your friends, your family members, bring your grandma. Just make sure she gets earplugs on the way in or else she'll be like, this is the devil's church. Anyways, and so... You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Some of y'all been there because it's so loud. Anyways, so uh, bring her to, I mean, every, everybody. Easter, three weeks away, it's going to be great. Again, we're not revealing the movies. May give you some hints on Facebook uh, coming up so you can follow us there, but it's gonna be a lot of fun. You guys ready for Easter already? Can you believe that's almost here? Two people, sweet. Okay, uh, we're continuing a series that we've been in uh, the last, uh, started last week called Get in the Game. Uh, Get in the Game, where we basically said we're going to talk about how to find your purpose and fulfill it in your life. Is that important? Is that important? It's very important. And you talk to people, people are interested in their purpose, they're interested in why they're here, so we're talking about it in this series. If you missed last weekend, this talk uh, builds on last weekend, so you'll definitely want to watch that online and get caught up at experiencelifenow.com experiencelifenow.com, and now you can actually get the uh, archive videos on your iPhone and any kind of uh, Mac portable device, iPad as well. If you don't have one, you need to invest in one, but that's another story for another day, so I'm j- just saying. Uh, but you can get those on our website and check, check out the talks from uh, uh, the previous weekends. But basically, we're going to pick up where we left off last weekend, talk a little bit more about purpose and some practical ways to get in the game. If you recognize that you're not right now fulfilling the purpose for which you've been created, we're going to talk about some ways to get in the game. So let's rejoin Paul in this conversation we started last weekend in Acts chapter 20. You got a Bible? Let's go. Acts chapter 20, page 157, if you're in this one, in the blue ones, 157. If you don't have a Bible, if it's not in a translation, you understand very well, we want to give you one of these on the way out. You pick one up, it is on us, because here's what I know about the Bible, maybe many of you know this as well. You start reading the Bible, you apply it to your life, it can change your life. How many of you guys know that to be true? It changed your life. So we want you to have a copy of this. It's a New Testament and a translation that's easy to understand, so pick one up on the way out if you'd like one. Acts 20. Starting in verse 25. Now, here's kind of my challenge to you. If, if you missed last week, or if, even if you were here, like read Acts 20 and keep reading it over and over and over again throughout your life. Like this is one of my favorite passages in the whole Bible. I mean, th- this, this stuff is huge. So you read it, you apply it, it can totally and radically uh, change your life. But we're just gonna continue the conversation today. Paul's got some more to say to us about, about purpose. We'll talk about some practical ways to get in the game. All right, verse 25. He says this, he says, and now I know that none of you to whom I have preached the kingdom will ever see me again. Remember last week in the context, he's talking to some leaders in a church that he planted in Ephesus, kind of a final conversation. He's saying, hey, trouble, suffering lie ahead for me. You may not see me again. So these are like some final words, uh, very important for them and also for us. So he's saying, hey, you know, you're not gonna see me again. Verse 26, he says this though. 
I love this. He says, but I declare to you today that I have been, what? What's that word? Read it again. Verse 26, I declare today that I have been what? That I have been faithful. I think that's what all of us would like to say, right, at the end of our lives. Like looking back that we've been faithful. Like Paul means he's been faithful. Like he did what Jesus told him to do. Like he fulfilled the purpose for which he'd been created. Like he's looking back, he's going, no regrets, man, for me. No, no regrets for me. Like, like I found my purpose finally, because you know Paul, man, was, was going in all the wrong directions for a while. Finds the purpose for which he'd been created. Man, he fulfills it, says, man, I'm looking back, I've been faithful. And I bet you every single person in this room would like to look back on their life and think I've been faithful, like I did what I was supposed to do. Like I fulfilled the purpose that God created me for, or not I just kind of messed around all of my life. All right, keep going. And he restates kind of what he believed was his purpose here. Second part of 26. He says, if anyone suffers eternal death, it's not my fault. Like, hey, here, here's the thing, leaders in the church in Ephesus, here, here's the thing for me. Like, I tried to take as many people to heaven with me as I could. Like, I'm heading that way, obviously, life may be short for me, but I've, I've tried to take as many people with me as I could. Like, I've told people what they needed to know. Like, I've told people about what Jesus did in my life, how they can get to heaven. Like, so if somebody suffers from eternal death, it ain't my fault. Like, it wasn't because I didn't tell them. Like, I told them. Like, I was out there telling them. And he says this, 27, this is huge. He says, for I didn't shrink from declaring all that God wants you to know. I didn't hesitate. I didn't shrink back. Like, I, I told you what God wanted you to know. Because see, here, here's the thing for Paul. Here's the thing for Paul, kind of a continuation from last weekend. He realized his purpose was to experience all God had for him in this life and to help others do the what? Do the same. He, he realized it wasn't just about him. It wasn't just for Paul about experiencing God's best in every area of his life. He wanted to help other people experience every, uh, God's best uh, for them in every area of their life. Not just about him, but about helping other people do the same. So he's saying to these guys, hey, I, to I, I told you what God would want you to know. Like, like I've, I've left it all on the table. Like, like here, here, here it is. Here it is. Here's how you can experience all God has for you in this life. So here's the question I think that this text begs. Because he's kind of saying the same thing he said in Verse 24, it's about me following Jesus or experiencing all he has for me, helping other people do the same. Helping other people do the same. So here's the question. Let's imagine this is your last week on this planet. Would you be able to look back and say that you've been faithful to do what Jesus has told you to do and that you've gotten the word out, the good news out about him, that you didn't shrink from telling your family, friends, coworkers, and neighbors all that God wants them to know? Would you be able to look back and say that? Like, like here's the thing. I, I told people I was trying to experience all God had for me, but I was trying to help other people. My friends, my family, I, I was trying to help other people experience all God had for them. Would, would you be able to say what Paul said here? This was your last week to live. I ask myself that question on a regular basis because that's how we want to live. Like if we want to fulfill the purpose for which we've been created, it's about ex obeying Jesus, following Jesus, and helping other people do the same. He was able to say it. Are you? Are you? Because if not, I would say God's probably calling you. He's probably calling me to get in the game. To get in the game and fulfill the purpose for which we've been created. Because check this out. Check this out. Many of us are taking our next step with God. You're, you're coming. You're listening. You're being challenged by God's word, wanting to take your next step. But it doesn't end there. It doesn't end there. According to Paul, it's also about you helping other people take next steps with God. It's also about you helping other people experience all God has for them in this life. Is, is that something you're after? Is that something you're pursuing? Because as we talk about some practical ways to get in the game, maybe a lot of you would be like, I've done that, I've done that, I'm in the game that way, I'm in the game that way, I'm in the game that way. Here would be my question for you today. How many people have you helped take step one? I know you've taken step one, but how many people have you helped take step one? How many people have you helped take step two, take step three? It's about experiencing all God has for us in this life and helping others do the same. That's the end game, folks. That's end game you want to know what the Bible says about purpose in life. And I believe, like I said last weekend, our joy and fulfillment in life is connected to our pursuit of that. Our joy and fulfillment, what you're looking for, what I'm looking for, it's connected to that. So let's get real practical again. Like last weekend, continue on with some practical ways you can get in the game. Let's say you're listening, you're reading this, you're like, I don't know if I've been faithful. I don't know if I was really experiencing all God had for me or helping other people do the same. I'm ready to get in the game. What are some practical ways, pastor, I can get in the game? Let's keep going with the list. Last week I gave you uh, three, really, and they're on the back of your connection card. If you have this and you want to track along here, you can, but they're on the back here. 
Because we call them, call them next steps, call them ways to get in the game, whatever. But last week in challenge, you got to commit your life to Christ. First step, getting in the game. Second step, get baptized. Go public with that decision. Third step, start volunteering. Church, nonprofit organizations, relief organizations. Start following Jesus. I guarantee you, you're going to become a servant. So some practical ways to get in the game. So let me, let me give you a few more. And these, again, are kind of a part of our next steps process. So the, the, the end goal of this process being, like I said last weekend, to help people commit their life to Christ, uh, to help them become radically obedient to him so they experience his best in every area of their life, and help others do the same. So to me, to me it, you know, if, if you want to know what I think, that's a formula for changing the world. And you've heard me talk about this before. And you're like, changing the world? What, what makes you think you can change the world? Here's all I know. I'm not that smart. All right, I'm not that smart, but here's what, here's what I know. I know a guy who single-handedly turned the world upside down. I know some of his followers together turned the world upside down. So I'm just saying, if we want to be a part of change in the world, if we want to be a part of change in the world, I think we would do well to follow them, to follow their lead, follow their example. They've done it. We, we do well to do what they did. So that's what we're talking about. So number four, we've already done three. Number four, fourth practical way to get in the game. You find it on the back of this card is this, to take the three-month tithe challenge. Take the three-month tithe challenge. And, and here, here's what I want you to know. If you start following Jesus, as I started to follow Jesus, we're going to get really generous if we start following him. Like generosity is going to follow. You start following Jesus, you're going to notice you're going to be getting radically generous. You know why? Because Jesus was radically generous. And I'm not talking about generous just toward the church. I'm talking about generous in general toward organizations that help the poor, organizations that help the hurting, organization, relief organizations. Like, you can get generous with the money God has given you. Take a look at this video. Well, my wife uh, always wanted to tithe uh, before. Uh, she's been to uh, other churches and, uh, well, it was really me that was a little bit against it because I always feel like if you buy something, you get something tangible back for it. A couple of years ago, uh, we made some uh, uh, resolutions and she had a list, I had a list, and both tithing uh, ended up on the list. And uh, so we started tithing and uh, uh, we've done it ever since. And it's just, it's, it's the greatest thing we've ever done. Uh, the only mistake we made is that we haven't done it before that time, so. Tithing has impacted us personally, I think, because now we have joy in our hearts. And I think it's just a gift from God, something that um, we've given in faithfulness, and He's proven to be faithful, and we now just, we really have joy. Well, if you're on the fence uh, with uh, tithing, I think uh, you should look at uh, my story. Uh, I've been on the fence for quite a long time, and I changed, and if I can change, everyone can do it. I think the Bible speaks clearly about tithing and the fact that you should give your first fruits to the Lord and we feel that the, for every paycheck that comes in we give our first 10% to God before we pay your mortgage or any other payments. We can give it in faithfulness saying this is what we're going to give to you. We know that you're going to take care of us and we feel it's really important. Well, through uh, tithing, uh, God blessed us uh, immensely. Uh, I was able to uh, win a ESPN game show, and because of that, I was also able to uh, give away a lot of the money uh, to good deeds to the church uh, again. Uh, and also, I was able to help a family with a uh, heart surgery, and it feels amazing to do that. So, uh, tithing definitely helps. I love how they say, and, and what I've found to be true, probably what you found to be true, is that the Bible does speak clearly about this. Sometimes we don't like what it has to say. That doesn't mean it doesn't speak clearly about this. Like they've seen it in their Bible, I've seen it in mine. You read your Old Testament, you're gonna see that even of the poorest Jew, 10% and actually more was required of his income to be returned to the Lord. You see it reaffirmed in the New Testament by Jesus and early church fathers several centuries after the Bible was written also taught it as a basic requirement for Christian living. So it's really, it's really not about, it's about generosity. You know, it's, it's not about a percentage, really about 10% because if somebody wanted to start with 12, I would totally understand that. Like, or 20, I get, I get that, I get that. But usually you're like, no, see, the reason, the reason that bothers me because I'd like to do far less. But I think all of us would agree $1 for every 10, and if, you know, it is, is a good place to start and might not even be considered that generous. It's generous, but one for every 10. And I, I tell people all the time, even if you don't have a vision for the church, even if you don't have a vision for the church, give $1 for every 10 to uh, nonprofit organizations, to relief organizations. You start following Jesus, I guarantee you, you're going to get radically generous. Now, here's, here's the deal with the three-month tithe challenge. It's basically a 90-day money-back guarantee on tithing. Bible says give 10%, God will bless you. So we just say, hey, try it for 90 days. We'll escrow the money. 
If you don't sense his blessing in your life, because he says we can test him in our giving, then uh, we'll give you every dime back. And people ask me all the time, has anybody asked for their money back? And like, we've got it ready to give. Like, we're not spending it. I mean, we got it ready to give. Has anybody asked for their money back? And it probably wouldn't surprise you for me to say that nobody has, because I believe everybody's been blessed as they've been generous toward things that matter. But here's what I've realized. I'm going to make this real practical. Because I know this can be a tough subject sometimes, kind of step on toes. Here's, here's what I've realized is that this whole tithing thing, or even giving to charities, all right, isn't as much about giving as it is where your heart is. Because we give to things we have a heart for all the time. We're already givers. Even if we don't give much to charity or give much away or churches or whatever, we're already givers. I, I know that we are. Let me, let me prove it to you. How many of you guys would say, like me, you keep Chick-fil-A in business? Anybody besides me? Come on, come on, come on. Anybody besides me keep Chick-fil-A in business? And you'll sit in a line of 35 cars for two and a half hours to get your hand on a nugget, all right? I mean, like, like, yeah, like a lot of us, a lot of us, like Chick-fil-A, like I'm a giver, dude. Like, I pay, I pay those bills. I pay those bills. Like, we eat Chick-fil-A. Anybody, uh, anybody keep Texas Roadhouse in business? C- come on. Come on, church. Come on, church. This, this is Jesus food. Anybody keep, anybody keep it? Yeah, yes. Yeah, some, some of you, here's the deal. If I ever, uh, up here on stage, die of a heart attack, I'll tell you why. I had a roadkill the night before. Now you're like, literally? No, it's the roadkill on our menu, all right? I mean, it's, it's, this, this stuff is a, is a heart attack on a plate, but I will, I will eat that. I mean, it, it's like 10-ounce chopped steak with, you know, smothered with cheese and mushrooms. And those rolls, dude, if you hadn't had those rolls and that butter, I mean, that's like 7,000 calories right there. It, I mean, that, that's, that, stuff will, that, that, that stuff will minister to you. I, I mean, that, 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 like Jesus started that restaurant. Anyways, and so, like, like, I know how to give. Like, I don't keep all my money for myself. I give. I give a lot of it to these places. Anybody besides me keep banks in business? Like, you got a loan or two, maybe a mortgage. Come on, church. Come on, church. Like, you got a mortgage, got some auto loans, like interest. Like, keep them in business. Like, here's, here's what I know about you and me. We give to things. Internet company, cable, I mean, we, we don't keep all our money. We, we give it to things. I just realized before I got in the game, I was giving it to a lot of things, but I wasn't giving it in places that mattered, ultimately. You know, whether it's toward the poor or relief in other countries, people starving all across our world to the advancement of the gospel. What I realized is I, I give, just I wasn't always giving to the most important uh, things. And so here's kind of what I think I came to understand is just that if I wasn't going to give to a church or a charity or whatever, if I didn't want to give my money to an organization like that, it wasn't because I wasn't a giver, because I give to a lot of things. It's just because I didn't have a heart for those things. Because you give to things you have a heart for. Your money, watch this, your money always follows your heart. Your money always follows your heart. So I guarantee you could tell where my heart is by looking at my checking account, see what transactions come in and out. I could tell where your heart is I look at your checking account. Our money follows our heart. We can say we have a heart for Haiti or a heart for what's going on in Japan or a heart for churches and the advancement of the gospel. But at the end of the day, church, just be honest. At the end of the day, our money follows our heart. We give to the things that matter most to us. When I got in the game, I realized, hey, advancement of the gospel, helping the poor, that should matter a lot to me. So we're done with that, but I did, did want to say thank you to all of you guys that financially invest in the ministries of this church and ministries of other places in the community. Thank you. Like, thank you, seriously. Like, you're world changers. Like, I mean, you guys are amazing. You, you, you are a part of what's going on here in a huge way, and, and just want to say thanks. So um, that's the fourth way that you can get in the game. Give. Churches, charities, give. Follow Jesus. You're going to become generous. Sixth way. Four, fifth way. I'm ahead of myself. Fifth way, attend a life house. Attend a life house. Take a look at this video. My husband and I started um, attending life house because we wanted to make friends and um, just create some connections within the church and um, just kind of get a little more accountability. Personally, LifeHouse has impacted us um, by just creating lots of relationships, lots of um, prayer partners, and um, it's been a really great ministry tool for our friends that we come in contact with and neighbors. We've um, actually invited a few friends who didn't attend church before, and now they um, attend eLife, and um, some of them going through divorce and um, cancer and different things, we've just really been able to um, come together in Christ and help each other up. 
but I would encourage everyone to just go. It's um, everyone's been there, you know. We've all had a first time, and um, everyone's pretty inviting. And um, the format is just really good for anybody new or old. It's great. Lifehouse has definitely built um, for my husband and I a community of believers and non-believers that we've been able to minister to each other and it's helped us grow um, spiritually for sure and in relationships. If you're on the fence about attending Lifehouse, I would say go. It's awesome. I tell you, uh, about 17, 18, when I really decided I was going to get in the game, got involved in a small group at the church I was going to, and I'm just telling you, that's where my life was changed, the context of community. Because I'm sure you know this to be true. It's a lot easier to apply God's word to your life in the context of other people doing the same thing than trying to do it alone. How many of you guys know that to be true? It's just, it's just easier. So here's kind of the point of life houses. And I, and I tell people all the time that you really haven't experienced all experience life has to offer until you've been to worship gathering, life house, like that's huge, in our, our prayer meeting. I mean, there's, there's definitely more than, than just this. But in life houses, here's what we do. We hang out, have a lot of fun. We apply God's word to our lives together and we serve together. I mean, here's what's cool about life houses. And, he, and this is the whole thing I was talking about, about last week about this process being so important because it gets you involved in serving the poor, serving the community. But in our life houses, each life house does one or two like service projects a semester. So as these groups continue to multiply, a day is gonna come here pretty quick where we're doing a service project as a church through life houses about um, you know, 365 uh, days out of the year. Like, all, like that many projects going on, like almost one a day throughout the year. So Experience Life, we believe in service, serving people, serving the community. Lifeway, Lifehouse is a great way to get accountability in doing that. Somebody said to me one time, they said, Pastor, I don't mean to offend you, um, but the weekend gathering, it's not my favorite thing. I said, oh yeah? They said, yeah, no, my, my favorite thing is uh, Lifehouse. I'm like, dude, no offense taken, mine too. Mine too, like seriously, since the beginning, that's been my favorite thing too, because you get to know people. Great way to get in the game and in the context of community, start applying God's word to your life. All right, next. Six, number six, attend the prayer gathering. Attend the prayer gathering. Take a look at this video. The first time that I went to Monday Night Prayer, I had heard about it and it always kind of seemed honestly kind of boring to go and pray for an hour. Um, but one particular weekend, my brother and my mom and I went that Monday because that weekend we found out my mom had uh, stage four ovarian cancer and probably didn't have much longer to live that night. You would have thought we walked in there bankrupt and walked out with a million dollars with the way the Lord moved. He, it was like he had a big old bowl of peace and just dumped it on top of my, my uh, brother and my mom and I. And the Lord just loved on us that night to the point that we, we had to go back the next Monday. We were already ready to go back that Monday. And it wasn't a peace that faded. It was a peace that stayed. And it, and it never went away, even to this point. On weekends, you know, it's it's amazing. God shows up on the weekends through the sermons and everything, but it's on Monday night when you walk in there and you can already feel that place is, God's art, God's waiting for seven o'clock to come around. And I feel like he's He's excited for what he wants to do and and it's uh, it's more personal. You're not pressured to get up there and pray if, you, if you're not comfortable. It's, it's completely what you're comfortable with but what I learned was that I soon became uncomfortable with sitting in that seat and I, the Lord gave me a heart for prayer just to get up and to get involved. So by taking one step by going to Monday Night Prayer, I ended up taking 10 steps with the Lord. I would say to someone who's on the fence about it um, to just come because something's happening at Experience Life because of prayer, because you know Jesus said, my house needs to be a house of prayer. And that's what eLife's doing is, is putting prayer first on Monday night. And God's moving and He wants you to be a part of it. And um, I, I feel like so many times we're always feeling like we're waiting on God, but most of the time He's waiting on us. It's Monday night that she's talking about at 715, powerful time. We often say this, According to the scriptures, we believe that closet prayer changes lives. Praying alone has power, changes lives.
but corporate prayer changes cities, has the power to change cities. You'll see all throughout the Bible, God calling his people to come together to pray. We've done this since day one at Elife, and anytime anybody calls us and says, hey, what happened? How'd you go from zero to however many you got in just a couple of years? We always say, you need to come on Monday night and find out for yourself. But here's the thing. We want to see our city change. We want to see the world change. We've got to gather together and pray. If we want to see addictions broken. We want to see marriages healed. If we want to see the lost uh, get saved. If we want to see relationships restored. Guess who is ultimately responsible for that? Guess who is ultimately the one that's able to do that? Give people the strength to do that. It's not me. It's not a sermon. It's Jesus. And so we come together and we ask him to move and do awesome things. It's, it's an incredible time. Somebody at Elife even once said to me, to, to, for them, prayer, the prayer night, is where the message becomes the movement. Where the message becomes the movement because we hear what we're supposed to do and some of you are hearing this going, I can't do this on my own. Exactly. We come together to pray and say, Lord, would you help us? Would you help us? Powerful meeting. Number seven, attend a life transformation group. Attend an LTG. Take a look at this video. Well, I started doing the LTG, honestly, because I had to. Um, it was part of the job. It was something that Chris required of us. But then, like, once I started it, it was something I kind of got hooked on. Um, and I, I felt that I just needed the accountability, um, and that was a great way to, to get it. So that's, that's kind of why I started LTG. LTG's been huge for me just because um, for us in our LTG, um, we have a group of guys that we're constantly text messaging each other or calling each other just to check and see if we've, we've had our time in the Word, if we've prayed. Um, so for me, just the accountability, just knowing that I have other guys out there depending on me um, to pray for them and that they're going to ask me throughout the week, you know, hey, how was your time with God? What'd you learn? What'd you read this week? Um, so for me, just the accountability side of it's been huge. It's really, it's, it's kind of been what I needed to, to keep, kind of push me over the limit and have me spend more time in, in the Word and in prayer. I think if you're on the fence um, about going to one of the LTGs, I would say just, just try it, man. Just go and give it a shot. Um, I think once you get in it and once you start, start taking part in, in the way the life transformation groups are set up, um, it's going to help you grow and it's going to be something that, that you're, you're never going to stop. And the LTGs or the life transformation groups actually meet at the end of our life house meetings. So the way to get involved in an LTG is to go to a life house. There's a break at the end of the meeting. You're able to leave if you need to, but if you want to stick around, you can. The groups break up by gender, guys meet the guys, ladies meet with ladies, and it's basically accountability and leadership development. And to me, this is the key. If we can get thousands of people involved in these groups, I mean, the world's going to be radically changed, no, no question about it, because you get accountability in things like this. And there's levels, so you don't necessarily start out with all these things, but here are some things you get accountability in if you want it in an LTG. Scripture reading, praying, journaling, scripture memory. Divine appointments or learning to share your faith and doing that on a regular basis. Following up with people, ministering to people that are in your path. Uh, confessing your sin uh, you know, to one another. Getting prayer for things that you're struggling with. Learning, doing in-depth Bible studies together and leadership development. I'm telling you, those, of, uh, those people in our church that are in, in LTGs would tell you, man, that's where it's at. Like that's where it's at. We all need accountability in our walk with the Lord. Number eight, number eight. These are just ways to get in the game. You can really start anywhere in here, in anything that God speaks to you about, connects with you on. You, you can start there. But uh, number eight is to become a covenant member. To become a covenant member. This was step three, actually, at one point. Now it's step eight because we're really seeing membership now is more of something that's helping keep people accountable in the next steps process as a whole. So instead of putting it at the very beginning, putting it at the very end. And membership, really, is just people that are saying, hey, we're fired up about the vision, and we want you to keep us accountable in taking our next step. Like we want to experience all God has for us in this life. That's what membership is. And we do some special things for our members. We pray for them specifically, a concentrated effort of prayer for our members. We also do a membership renewal each year. And that's just so we can kind of figure out where they're at in the next steps process and know how we can <clears throat> better pray for them and then help them take their next step. Uh, but man, I'm telling you, for, for some of you guys, this may be a next step for you because you want accountability in these uh, other steps. So that's what membership's all about. Let me show you how you can become a member. It's actually pretty easy. You can take the class online, but show you a video here. Um, if you just go to our website, click on Next Steps. If you scroll down a little bit and you'll find number eight is Become a Covenant Member, you click on that. 
go to the bottom of the screen, there's a button there called Start the Class. And when you click that, you can watch a video just about how our church got here, our story, what we're all about, what membership's all about. Then basically you can sign up to talk to a pastor online, meet with a pastor, you know, next weekend or weekend after that and become a member. So pretty simple process, but maybe a way that God might be calling some of you to get in the game. And then here's the thing, we don't put this on the, on the back of, of these cards here, but steps nine and 10 are really leadership steps. And that is leading a life house and coaching a life house. It's been my vision since we started that everybody one day that wants to would be able to lead a life house. And that's kind of where you go from experiencing all God has for you to helping other people do the same. Because check this out. You're leading a life house and a group multiplies off of yours and then a group multiplies off of theirs and then you're multiplying again. It isn't long. It isn't long for you're indirectly leading or coaching hundreds of people in applying God's word to their life in practical ways. I'd call that making a difference. I call that making an impact when you're helping hundreds of people experience all God has for them in this life. So I just kind of unloaded all that on you. Got 10 of them, basically. And I would just just tell you this. Like I told you last week, that's my story. These steps, basically, it wasn't even an experience life. This was my story of how I got in the game and began to feel like I was fulfilling the purpose for which I'd been created. I was serving. I was giving. I was trying to advance the gospel, share my faith, going for it, doing it in the context of the community, helping other people. And I was going, man, this is it. This, this is it. So I would say, man, if you're in the game, praise God for you, man. Stay in the game. Stay in the game. Keep taking next steps with, with the Lord. But also start praying about who God would have you help take their next step. Even if you've taken all these steps, who have you helped take step one? Who have you helped take step two and progress in the relationship with God? And then I would say, if you're not in the game, would you at least pray? Would you at least pray and say, God, how do you want me to get in the game? I think if you're a follower of Jesus, he's going to call you to get in the game in some way. Would you pray about it and just say, Jesus, how do you want me to get in the game? Because at the end of the day, church, here's, here's the deal. We've got to have everybody in the game to change the world. Again, we're not about sitting and soaking. We're about changing the world. It takes everybody being in the game. The best way to communicate with us just is on the back of this card. If any of these have kind of stood out to you and you've been like, dude, i got to get in the game in that way, the band's going to come up here in just a second. They're going to lead us in another song. We've got boxes in the back. You can drop these in. But after kind of two weeks of this whole purpose thing, I mean, this is a huge deal. I want you to have some time to just respond. Some time to respond and just say, God, what do you want me to do with what I have heard? It takes everybody in the game to change the world. And I want you to know that's what experience life is all about. Let's pray together. God, thank you for this time. Thanks for the ways, God, that you provide for us in your word that we can get in the game, leading other people to experience all you've got for them, experiencing all you've got for us. God, and I just pray for my friends today that if they're not in the game, they get in the game. If they're in the game, God, that they'd help other people to get in the game. But that, God, you would use us to change our city. We want to see marriages healed in our city. We want to see the crime rate drop in our city. We want to see the poor served and the homeless sheltered in our city. God, we don't want to just sit around. We want to change the world. And so, God, I know you're challenging me to get in the game in some ways. God, I pray that you challenge my friends here as well. As the band plays, God, I pray that you just place on their heart what way you'd have them to get in the game. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for checking out one of our messages today. If you made a decision to commit your life to Christ, I'd love to know about it. You can email me at chris at experiencelifenow.com. Also, if you're interested in taking a next step, check out our website at experiencelifenow.com and click on Next Steps. Let us know if we can ever serve you in any way, and we look forward to seeing you soon.